So thousands of new people have poured into our fan since that date, and they really deserve to be updated on the funnel and, the, and what their concerns may be, and that's why these, this series of meetings has come together. So we are the people's, oh, I should say good afternoon. We are the people's fertile working group. We're a group of concerned citizens who believe that there needs to be more transparency and accountability from the mayor, from the city council, from city departments, and the recreation board in Waltham. And regarding the fertile site, which was formerly known as the Walter E. Fernald Developmental Center. My name is Nina Adwin. I'm going to introduce the others on the working group. We also here today is Diana Young, she's at the back. <laughs> Jonathan Park, Jonathan Bernard, George Dutch, Jonathan and Lizzie Gellis went to where is she? She just left us. <laughs> All right. There she is. We particularly welcome you, the concerned citizens. Our goal is to influence decision makers. The project reflects the desire of the majority of Walt and Rich and that the eventual outcome is respectful to and honors the many thousands of residents that were part of the fertile story. We truly thank you for taking the time to come today for this meeting and to continue the dialogue and provide your input. We want to remind everybody that there is a citizen's input hearing this coming Wednesday evening at the City <coughs> Center. Right, yeah. Um, the meeting is being, oh, it's at 6 p.m. Uh, at Government Center, which I think everybody knows is 119 Score Street. The meeting is being held as a direct result of the pressure that we, this group, and the folks that have participated in the two former meetings that we've held, have brought to bear on the City Council. What we do makes a difference. We know that it's difficult to go to a midweek session after work, but it's crucial that we show up and be seen and be heard. Later, we'll share how you can participate in the meeting to make it more meaningful. I want to take a minute just to um, acknowledge two um, folks in the audience who are uh, here uh, in their formal capacity. We have Colleen Berlin Parker, who is Councillor of the Her uh, candidacy for Stater for, for this area. So, Hello, thank you for coming as well. <laughs> Everything you hear today is designed to give you the relevant knowledge to empower you with the necessary information to be confident in asking questions at that meeting and going forward. We will also share with you some additional meetings that you might be interested in attending regarding FOMO and the project. We made a map available, and that was at the back of the room. I hope everybody got one. For context, the Fernal was, was the Western Hemisphere's oldest publicly funded institution serving people with developmental difficulties, dating back to its inception uh, as the School for the Feeble Minded in South Boston in 1948. When they ran out of space, in Boston in the, in the 1880s, the legislature appropriated the funds to relocate the sanatorium to Waltham, breaking ground in 1888. Under the administration of its third superintendent, Walter E. Fernald, from 1888 to, 18, to 1924, the school became renowned as an institution involved with the American eugenics movement during the 1920s. It goes without saying, but I must, that the residents were abused, malnourished, hardly educated, and oblivious participants to the, many, to the medical experimentation. They had few or no rights, and many died. We have four speakers this afternoon. I'm Brian Parcel, who we met here before, has been overseeing the recordation project since 2014. He will present photographs of the decrepit conditions of the property and show the appalling lack of responsibility on this valuable and historic asset since it came into the hands of the Waltham City Government. George Darcy is a former City Council member 
and he will update the group on the current state of the property and to the best of his understanding, the work that is currently being undertaken on the site. Diane Young, a former chair of the Community Preservation Committee, will explain the mayor's latest action regarding the RFP request for leasing the building for housing. But first, I have to say we are really thrilled to introduce a very special guest, Oliver Egger. Oliver is a graduate of Wesleyan University in Northampton, Connecticut, and he currently assists He's currently the assistant editor at the Wesleyan University Press. He's the Kim Frank Fellow in Creative Writing at Wesleyan Shapiro Center for Creative Writing and a contributing writer at the Provincetown Independent Newspaper. Oliver is the great grandson of Walter E. Fernald and the third director, the third director of the name and namesake of the Fernald State School, and the first school for the developing, developmentally disabled in the Western Hemisphere. Oliver was born and raised in Durham, North Carolina. While he now lives in Connecticut, his roots reside here in Waltham. We are very thrilled that Oliver is willing to take the time to travel here on a Sunday afternoon to speak with us. Please join me in giving Oliver a good day. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for welcoming me today. I'm Al Gregor, and I'm the great great grandson of Walter E. Fernald, the third superintendent of the Fernald School and its namesake. Um, my grandmother, who died this past April at the age of 90, and is now buried here at Mount Auburn Cemetery beside Walter Fernald, said to me that every family has to have an archivist, that being a part of a family is about more than the present but about passing the torch of our history, however complicated, to future generations. To me, that mission became the Fernal, the stories of both my great-great-grandfather and the children at the center. This began as a poetry project, actually, and I'll share one poem with you today, but if you're interested in that, you can talk to me afterwards. But um, that began as a poetry project, writing poetry in response to historical documents from the Fernal. Um, it is now transformed into an investigation into the current moment and the evidence of ongoing neglect on the Fernal campus. In addition with Brian, we are compiling an oral history of the Fernal, which I also would like to welcome all of you, if you have connections to the Fernal or know someone who is connected to the Fernal, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to hear your story. I hope from this talk you will see that an interest in our history cannot just live in an intellectual space, but rather needs to be needs to be supported by persistent effort and activism here in the present. And you seated here today have that potential to turn your city's history into action. But first, for, for my promise, I'll start with one poem. So, um, these poem title is titled The 20th Annual Report of the Trustees of the Massachusetts School of Idiotic and Feeble-Minded Youth, October 1867. Um, which is, these were annual reports made from the school towards the, um, na towards the state government to get funding. So and those are all available online, and they're really interesting. Um, I was aiming to kind of read against the institutional language, the kind of sterile language, and try to look into a kind of poetic register through it. Um, so then it has a subtitle. This subtitle is directly taken from the text of the trustees report. In sum, this parental regard for the feeble-minded children results in undue indulgence 
The appetites and propensities and the elements of the animal nature are cultivated in an undue degree. Then the child becomes inordinately sensual, willful, and selfish. Two such boys were recently offered to the blind institution, who had been never taught to dress themselves, nor even button any part of their clothes. One of them, although eight years old, yet wore the costume of babyhood to save him care and trouble. And here's the problem. Blind boys, broken gravel, gray dirt, skin sunk in unending earth, could we start again? Blind boys, unable to button their shirts, mothers, why is it you, always you, who bites? Blind boys, tasting iron or dust before rain here, train tracks shout 40 miles past Boston, count each night, each long second of dust, play dead on their backs, sobbing for safety. Baby clothes on big boy bodies, stink of diapers, scared spider of an upheld hand. Blind boys, nowhere grip paths of were we not gentle. Good. Was it our mothers who could not sew each strand of our bodies towards that beauty in us, past the tired infant of our eyes? Blind boys, idiot boys, hopeless, helpless baby boys, let us guide each button of your body and close it behind our hair. Um, I'm going to now get into some of the history. It was already beautifully introduced, but you know, it's never bad to learn something again. So um, the school originally named the Massachusetts School for the Feeble-Minded and the Idiotic Student in South Boston. But it wasn't until 1925, the year after the death of my great-great-grandfather, who served for 37 years as superintendent that the board changed the name to the Walter E. Burnham State School. The school was originally founded in 1848 by Samuel Gridley Howe. You might know um, Julia Gridley Howe, who wrote The Battle of the Republic, which is a famous Civil War song. Um, so with the intent of training disabled children to become functional members of society, it was designed as a boarding school where kids would be admitted for a few years, then released back into the general population. That's, that was the initial plan. So this is a photo, these are two photos from my family archive. You can see there's some resemblance to the mustache. Um, and uh, this other photo is, is Ashley Colonel. That little girl um, um, is my great-grandmother, Helen Shaw, or originally Helen Fernald, who my mother is named. Um, it wasn't until Fernald's tenure, and then the relocation to Walton, which provided much more space and cleanliness than the old property in South Boston, that the center changed. Becoming more an institution as it exists in the popular imagination. A place where children were segregated from society based on a widespread belief that mentally disabled children had a propensity for criminality. This ideology was based on a handful of deeply flawed case studies that for a period fundamentally changed the center from a school to something resembling a prison. Forcing mentally disabled children in the center long into adulthood. Keeping them from holding jobs, having families, or being members of their communities. In his time, Walter Fernald was renowned for bringing a more scientific-based approach to care at the center, making him one of America and the world's leading figures on mental disability. Doctors and politicians from across the world would travel to Walton to study the methods employed at the center. But he's a complicated figure. As his, con as his contributions to child psychiatry include an, amount, an incredible amount of revolutionary care. This includes emphasizing childhood play, special education, and the creation of the first independent farm communities, which were run and built solely by disabled people. However, as many of you know, many of his ideas caused widespread and lingering harm to the disabled community that persists today. Though he never supported sterilization, Fernald did for a period advocate for the segregation of mentally disabled children from society. He also coined the term defective delinquent, something which you might still hear today to describe criminally inclined mentally disabled children. Um, and this is from one of these trustees' reports, talking about how segregated people-minded is to cut off our most public resources and crime. Um, it wasn't until the end of his life, which I actually didn't know about this until uh, I learned from Alex, which is that he had a reversal of many of these ideas, fighting against the segregation of most mentally disabled children, rejecting IQ tests, and supported community education and outpatient clinics. However, by this time, many of his ideas about segregation and institutionalization had firmly entered the mainstream, American understanding of the way that disabled children should be managed. His work bears a significant responsibility for the mistreatment and segregation 
that hundreds of American medical institutions practiced during and after his lifetime. I want to tell you personal family stories about Walter Fernald, but it's hard. My grandmother was born after her grandfather, Walter Fernald, died. Um, but her mother, my great-grandmother, Helen Shaw, or Helen Fernald, adored her father, and she told stories of going with Fernald, who apparently everybody called Doc, including his children, would take her, taking her through the halls to say goodnight to all the children. But she also said he was a chronically hard-working man, staying up late into the night, traveling far and wide, lecturing his beliefs. Uh, my, my grandmother told me that Walter Fernald traveled to Smith College to talk the president into letting his daughter attend at the age of 16 because he wanted to get her off the property. He was very protective. Um, so in, in addition, the death of his son, Walter Jr., of the 1918 pandemic, that's him there, also some of them, um, after coming back from the First World War, changed him. Um, in a letter from 1922 to C. Caldecott, he writes that his son was the pride and joy of my life. There's a story in my family that because his son died unexpectedly, they didn't have a place to bury him at first. Walter Fernald used the little money he had to buy the family plot at Mount Auburn and said, or so the story goes, that no one in our family would ever have to worry again about where to be buried. Helen Shaw told my grandmother that he was never really the same after his son's death that a quietness followed him. Perhaps this death allowed him to see the errors in past ways, as it was a turning point where he firmly disavowed most of the eugenics policies. After a finishing trip in New Hampshire, Fernald died on Thanksgiving Day, 1924. This is something I just found a couple weeks ago, which is the telegram from the governor on Fernald's death. I found this in a box in my uh, grandma's uh, desk. Um, so this is probably the Fernald that you all know about, which is the Fernald um, in the 1950s and 60s, which became one of the most salient examples of mental institutions' mistreatment of disabled children. Um, this has already been touched on, but students were malnourished, sexually physically abused, made unwitting participants in medical experiments, such as the Science Club, which was when a group of children were fed radioactive isotopes in their oatmeal in experiments led by MIT and Harvard and sponsored by Quaker Oats. In December of 1965, uh, the Bird and Blatt photographer Fred Collette snuck, snuck under five state institutions to the disabled, including the Fernald Center, and took heart-wrenching photos of the mentally disabled children and adults suffering under violent conditions. And they published them in this book, Christmas in Purgatory, a photographic essay on mental retardation, which had a large impact on bringing public attention to the depraved conditions across Massachusetts state institutions. In 1972, a class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of mentally disabled clients at the nearby Belcher School, claiming the school violated residents' statutory and constitutional rights, including the right to minimally adequate care and treatment. Similar cases were filed by patients at the Fernald School and three other centers and consolidated into one lawsuit, Ricky v. Oakton. The courts declared the level of care at the center indefensible, and the state of Massachusetts was forced to improve the conditions for the patients, including better facilities and mandatory staffing. The quality of life for patients after this did radically improve, but it was costing the state of Massachusetts an inordinately large amount of money, reported at $1 million per patient per year in the uh, Washington Post in 2003. In 2003, uh, then Governor Mitt Romney announced his intentions to close the Fernal. This led to a series of lawsuits and delays, but eventually, on Thursday, November 14, 2014, the final patient was discharged from the firm. The same year, as many of you know, or maybe were a part of, the school's 196 acres were sold to the city of Walton from the state for the bargain of $3.7 million. As part of the agreement, Walton Mayor Jeanette McCarthy, still your mayor, <laughs> Pledge the city would provide extensive historical documentation of the property. As part of the purchase agreement with the state, this is all online, the mayor said the initial step would be to hire a security company to hire the 200 acre property and to take the necessary steps to secure the buildings. Only a small number of the buildings were secured by the building department, and a security company was never hired, with the responsibility being put on the Waltham Police Department. It was the state's responsibility under the Department of Developmental Services 
to remove the confidential documents from the property. However, a large number of them were left behind. In 2020, the city police cut sharply on the patrolling of the property. This led to a mass influx of vandalism. This is a fact which the city police had in its name. Brian Parcel, who will be speaking later, set up a series of trail cameras to capture this trespassing. Um, he recorded over 5,000 trespassers. Um, he shared this information with the police and the mayor's office, uh, but no action was taken to for the security of the property. So the trespassers broke into these unsecured buildings and soon discovered confidential documents. These documents include sensitive materials that are protected under HIPAA. They include patients' names, employees' names, and a range of details of their lives, such as their medication, their behavior, their age, their financial status, etc. These documents were thrown around, destroyed, and stolen. As many of you may know, I wrote a piece about this with Brian's photography, which came out in the Boston Globe in January. DDS has recently sent out a statement admitting that they had left behind documents that had confidential information and have supposedly removed them. Um, however, I have spoken to numerous people after my piece came out who have either taken or know someone who has taken a large number of confidential documents from the property when it was under the city of Walton's care, meaning many can never be recovered. I am very honored to be here today, and I deeply appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. However, I would be remiss to not mention that coming to Waltham can feel challenging for me. Because it seems to me that the, on, that the sheer amount of neglect and the damage that was ongoing at the center was often an open secret that little has been done, that little has been done to address it. In preparation for the Globe article, I sent numerous emails and calls with information that there were documents on the campus, the city council members, and the mayor's office for months and months in advance of the article's publication. I received no replies from anyone. And DDS, when I spoke to them the first time in October, said that no one had told them there were confidential documents left behind, that there were zero file reports or complaints by the city of Walton. I understand, though. My family rarely talks about our ancestor, Walter E. Colonel. In 2020, when I pressed my grandmother about him and the institution she led, she said, I don't have any horror stories about Grandpa Fern, if that's what you want. What did I want? Wouldn't it be easier to turn away? But my grandma passed the role of family archivist on to me. And it is my responsibility to maintain the reality of our past. A past that includes the uneasy, easy truth of who my great-grandfather was, and the good, as well as the harm his work caused and still causes today. It's easy to avoid complicated history. But just as a family must nurture the current generation by holding on and sharing the complicated stories of its past, our society, our city, can only sustain its citizens, in particular the survivors of state violence, by protecting its most challenging documents and buildings, because these are the bones that build its history. Allowing these confidential documents to be destroyed signals that disabled people are outside of history, are not worth the right to privacy and preservation we are all guaranteed under the law. Neglect never allows us to hide from the difficult past. Rather, it haunts us like a shadow, perpetuating ever deeper harm to the most vulnerable members of our communities. And these are two buildings of the Colonel from 2015 when the city bought it to now in 2023. We are not powerless. And I'm not coming up here to say, to point fingers to say that anyone did anything wrong. This is a very complicated issue, and we all have the capacity to turn to, we all have to, let me start here. We have the capacity to turn to the things inside us. For me, it's poetry, writing, the arts, journalism. For Brian, it's photography. And for you, it might be attending meetings like this, talking to your friends, your elected officials, or just learning and engaging more with the history of disability. Because whether you like it or not, this city is at the forefront of that history. It is. It's not going anywhere. And you have the potential as its residents and its leaders to embrace that history. It's a history worth embracing. Though the documents are cleaned up, that rotting campus is our responsibility. And together we could create something amazing. 
We could create a museum for and by people with disabilities. We could create affordable housing, support for veterans, for lower income people. This is not a burden, but an incredible opportunity for all. And I know you're all here because you're doing that. But to do this, we have to, like Walter Fernald, imagine and create a world vastly different from our own. If what you see on those nearly 200 acres today doesn't match your values, if you disagree with the mayor's current plans for the property, we can't just intellectualize our displeasure. We have to do something. Because history is right now. Fertile's legacy, my great-great-grandfather and the institution, is an active, living, breathing thing we can influence. There are two ways the story can go. Either we continue on the course we're on, a course where confidential documents were able to languish for a decade, and the buildings lay in pieces. Or this could be a story of a community creating from his ruins, a place that supports its present and its future while embracing the possibilities, the pain, and the power of its past. Because the past is not past. If you were to walk to the dining hall building today at the Fernal, you'd see a caved-in roof, a crumpled and shattered floor. But beside that, you'd see an old grave beside the building. There the children would eat outside, and then when they were done, they'd throw their old silverware down into it. If we went there right now, if you look at it now, it's still there. The forks, the knives, the spoons that children eat with. Just as it was, fragments left, children's lives. Thank you.
Um, Walton had a chance to think about those buildings, too. Uh, Walton did do some good things. Um, now, there were a number of buildings that were used as residential housing for you know, kind of uh, advanced placement residents um, called cottages. Uh, these were development of the 1970s, uh, in the 1980s, and they were they were group pumps uh, for for funeral living. And uh, Walton did decide to tear those down. They could have been used for housing, but there was actually a pretty good reason for them to be torn down. They were built illegally in the first place um, on wetlands, and so the city and the parks department have actually done a really nice job in restoring a lot of the wetlands where those cottages used to be. So I think that was impossible. Now I understand the plan is to pay over the parking lots for, for an amusement park. Am I exaggerating on that, George, or is that true? Um, the proposal, the, the large proposal is for 500 parking spaces. Currently, it's being developed with 100 parking spaces. Undoing some of the parks has already been done on the wetlands. Sorry. Undoing what parks has already done on the wetlands? No. Or am I misinterpreting that? Um, Doing other work, other. Okay. I'll explain my Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I was more um, concerned that they might undo some of the nice work that they've already done. Okay. All right, so a, a couple of other things to um, talk about. Um, I've mentioned in the last two meetings that my colleagues and I have been developing a website um, that goes into the history of each of the buildings on the site, along with photographs of each of the buildings on the site. We finally put that website online, uh, so you can go there and check it out. It is still a work in progress, so check on it every couple of days or a couple times a week because we're going to keep adding photos. We have what's the site? Uh, it's, it's this one right here. It's fernandstateschool.com, and this was produced in the periphery of the recordation project. The recordation project was delivered on hard drives to um, to six offices of the city. This is you know kind of a, a tangential piece, not not necessarily well, not at all by the city, but it does involve uh, photographs taken you know, while we while we were on the site. So the um, we took over ten thousand photos, and uh, we're still debating amongst ourselves which one should actually be online. So it will change from time to time. You know, each time you you log in, and and some of the buildings don't have. A lot of um, <coughs> photography represented yet, but I'll just show you a little bit of the site. But you can explore it on your own. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Okay. So the site right now has three categories that we're going to keep adding categories, um, particularly as Oliver mentioned, um, oral history, written histories of people who were involved working there. Uh, living there, um, being residents, and being treated there. We have a, um, the, the main part of the site is the list of buildings, and then as we find historical materials, you can see um, a good number of old photographs, the campus map, documents that are available, and even a link to some annual reports. There was a gap in history where some annual reports were not kept right after uh, World War II, I believe. Uh, Alex, is that true? Is that the gap? Okay. So it's the historical material section. Uh, we also have an interactive map, which I imagine is going to start changing. Um, it's been somewhat static uh, since the time the city purchased the property up to the demolition of the cottages. But you can trace the history of the campus with the emergence of each building um, and a little write-up about you know, what, what happened when. So just by moving this little slider along, you can see the history of the campus. So in terms of the buildings, each of the buildings has a... Uh, does anyone else hear the angels? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. The it's a moral cast. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Don't be out there. Okay. It's not a bad thing. Okay. Each of the buildings has its own subpage where you'll see uh, some photographs and a little write up of the history of each of the buildings. 
So I'd like to highlight one or two of these as an example of the lack of imagination. Uh, Walter, uh, Walter Fernald, as Oliver mentioned, had a vision, um, and I think the more meetings we have, the deeper we can go into this, you know, uh, into this vision. Um, and it's a vision that others kept building and building and building on. So let's start with the Chapel of the Holy Innocents. Uh, this goes back to 1960. This, I believe, is one of the buildings that has been of interest for preservation on the part of the city. And you can see it uh, was actually quite a lovely little chapel. Back to its day. Oops, and, uh, online is having some issues. When the city of Waltham bought the uh, property, this was the sanctuary then. Beautiful stained glass. Great condition. Pristine. It was absolutely stunning how pristine uh, this place was. <coughs> this to me was the most moving thing of all. Uh, these were tiles made by children in uh, the activity center for a program. And each tile has the name of the child who made the tile. Lovely stained glass. Needed to clean up, for sure. I would like to show you the chapel more recently. That's after 10 years of neglect. In 2021, you know, not only did the ravages of neglect and vandalism strike the chapel, but so did arson. So there was arson in um, one of the appending areas to the sanctuary. Uh, fire was put out, but there was substantial damage, uh, smoke damage, water damage. And because the building was sealed up right after the fire was put out, mold damage, you know, as, as well. So this isn't necessarily a lack of imagination. This is lack of doing this properly. Somebody sets a fire and wants to tear out um, a building. But because the building was unsecured, people were able to get inside and set a fire you know, to the chapel. And then I know Diane is going to go into the current idea of um, some of the buildings that we lease um, or, or propose pieces. With our imaginations, let's go back in time to Wallace Hall, Seaborn Hall, to where the building is built as a residence. Initially as infirmaries, but later residences. Between the 64 beds, both the power on could have immediately become housing. Buildings needed to be cleaned up, for sure, but they were in, in good shape. We can imagine that. At the time, we could not imagine doing that. And now, as a result, these buildings have been absolutely ravaged by vandalism, by weather, by raccoons, by, by all kinds of things going on in those buildings. And one of them, Sequin Hall, is now being offered uh, up for proposed lease. Who's going to want it? I will, I will show you. Now, one, one thing I don't have is early photos of um, Seguin, but I, I think last time I did show some of the early photos of Wallace, and uh, Oliver showed one of them side by side, so you can, you can see some of the deterioration. <laughs> Seguin and Wallace both share the exact same um, blueprint of this Wallace. So just as a reminder, Seguin and Wallace were absolutely identical. They both looked exactly like this. Yeah, there was some sand tile damage, but easily cleaned up. Okay, let's... On the website, you scroll down, that's when you get to the more recent photos. 
Who's going to want to lease that? You could save these two buildings. The, these buildings uh, are structurally in pretty good shape. Um, you would have to completely gut them. If they had been simply taken care of 10 years ago, we would not be, they would not be in this situation right now and could be housing even today. City expects in return to one who have actually, you know, agreed to one of these leases. But I, I wonder if anyone who's put these buildings up for lease has actually walked inside them. Yeah. They have a site that's equal to 20. Yeah. Yeah. Again, doable, but um, I will leave it to Diana and George to talk about the possible motives on the part of the city for wanting to put some of these buildings up for lease. So uh, I would draw attention on your on your own if you are interested um, to look on the website at those that are, are being considered for uh, lease, and that would be Dolan Hall, uh, which is this one right here. by the state as shelters um, at the end of Vermont's history. And both are in structurally very good shape and both also need to be gutted even before Waltham bought them into those buildings um, all had you know, problematic floors. So uh, they, they need to be reconsidered. The North Building, the North Building is the only one on the lease list that's actually in pretty good shape and, and is still in good shape. And the North Building, is, is the only realistic one. Uh, North Nurse was in pretty good shape back in 2015. The upper floors are okay. The uh, lower floor is, is not in good shape at all. Uh, Seaman Hall is on that list, and Tarbell Hall. So if you want to look at the photos, um, you, can, you can check those out on your own. So um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I did want to reiterate something that I brought up at the last meeting. And you see some of the uh, t-shirts that my friend Michael here has in his advance. We, I would very much like to continue building on a proposal to, in some way, save and preserve what I like to call the core four. The core four, as a reminder, the schoolhouse and gymnasium. Um, this is where special education began. Right here in Waltham, we have the most historic schoolhouse in the Western Hemisphere, and it's right here in Waltham, just a few miles from here. <coughs> Lack of imagination refused to see it that way, but there it is. Well, yes, there were problematic issues with pulling people onto this campus without, you know, letting them, giving them any kind of uh, way out, but yet, Walter Fernal figured out how to teach them. And we still build on many of these methods today. That schoolhouse, could have been saved very easily. <laughs> now it's structurally absolutely fine, needs to be gutted. But I think this one should be considered very, very heavily as something worth saving, something worth preserving, something where there could be a museum, where there could be a center for special education and, and disability rights and advocacy. I think this building would be a very, very good one um, to keep on the preservation list. This is the original boys dormitory. It's currently listed on the map as an activity center. That was the last thing it was used for in the um, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, it was closed in the early 80s, um, and ever since the building is in a state of near complete collapse. But there is a way, I think, to, to preserve a chunk of it. Uh, I mentioned the last meeting, so I won't go too deep into it. This building represents 
the most aspirational dormitory living ideas on the part of Walter Fernald and George Charbel. Walter Fernald realized very quickly it was impractical, made a lot of changes to it, while it was, even while it was being built. But there's nothing like it in any other state institution, not just in this state, but anywhere else. It's like the most aspirational idea for housing people, um, not just with developmental disabilities, but housing people in close quarters anyway. I think there's an architectural and historical significance to preserving even a tiny chunk of this one. The girls' dormitory at Chipman Hall is where Walter Fernald himself really stepped in and worked directly with the architect, William Preston, to design something that would be a lot more efficient. Chipman Hall then became the model for all of the other residences on this campus. Chipman Hall became a model for residences in other state institutions and beyond. So Chipman Hall, architecturally and historically, is also incredibly significant, like these other two buildings just down the road, you know, three miles from here. The original administration building, Waverly Hall. Uh, this is where all the offices were. Uh, this is where staff residences were. This is where Walter Fernand and his family lived for some time. Uh, this building, similar to the Boys' Room Girls' Room, is in a state of collapse, but I think there is a rationale to say they, uh, at least a chunk of it. Schoolhouse today, Chicken Hall today, uh, Waverly Hall today, Boys' Dorm today. Okay. And I also mentioned this last time. This is the Boys' Dorm right here. This is Waverly Hall. Chipman Hall down here, school and gym over here. They surround the natural courtyard, connected by sidewalks. This would be an amazing memorial park with a museum, special education, disability rights advocacy center in the schoolhouse and gym, and then a memorial chunk of three of the other very important buildings surrounding a beautiful park that has 150-year-old trees. You know, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gorgeous place. And I really hope this does not become a parking lot. So there is some precedent. This is the smallpox hospital on Roosevelt Island. Similar shape to the buildings I just mentioned. Look what they did. They saved the facades. There is a way architecturally to do this if you have an um, imagination, if you have a mind for it. You can save a chunk of a building around a park that already exists. Closer to home, they did this on Pettix Island in the Boston Harbor, the old Fort Andrews. They boarded up some of the buildings that could still stand so nobody can get in them. They're maintained, grounds are kept, and Chunks of significant buildings are still there. So you can remember and experience um, imaginatively the history that was there. It was the same for Pearl. So with that in mind, I would like to continue to advocate for this idea to preserve these core four structures um, in some way. Because in our neighborhood, it is one of the most important institutions of its kind historically. So thank you everybody for, for letting me speak with you today. And thank you Oliver for the great collaboration last year. And thank you Alex, it's been a great collaboration for the last however many years, a long time. Thank you everybody.
But we don't want to, Lizzie, I don't know if this here is what we don't want to do. Shirley Road, 
neighborhoods. That's the goal that was written on the application that the mayor submitted. Now the status of what's happening to this, and I'm just going to more or less read the slide. On March 10th, the Waltham Conservation Commission Chair told the city of Waltham to stop work occurring within 100 feet of the existing wetlands along Trapella Road. Um, as I stated earlier, they occur on the 1972 wetlands atlas. The city of Waltham complied until it received an engineering report from their contractor that said that the area in question was not a wetland. In response to the engineering letter, the city told Green Acres, they are the contractor that's building the site, to resume work within the 100 foot buffer of the wetlands on Trapella Road. Um, four days ago, at its Thursday, March 21st meeting, the Waltham Conservation Commission um, noted that the city's engineering report did not contain information that explains its reasoning, nor did it include the data that is normally provided to, in such reports. So to deal with that, the Waltham Conservation Commission on Thursday um, voted to have their, um, to have the city's report peer reviewed by an independent third party. So that's where we're at right now, and that third party report will help determine if the wetlands are state regulated, and B, that um, if alteration will have any effect on the flooding downstream on Shirley Road and Upton Road. So, you know, um, favorable, I think, that, that we'll get some traction with that. But we'll have to see, and I will have a list of the upcoming Conservation Commission meetings so that you can watch them. They're held on Zoom. The next project I'd like to speak about is the proposed MWRA Metropolitan Water Tunnel Project. Um, who knows about this project? Quite a few, that's great. So, um, if the relocation of the city's waste material, waste material operation, aka the city yard, to the fernal were not enough for the residents of Waverly Oaks Road and Trapella Road, the nearby residents will be further impacted by the installation of a construction and service shaft at the fernal site for the construction of the MWRA tunnel. And just to preface, MWRA provides drinking water for 3 million residents of eastern Massachusetts. MWRA has won many awards for the quality of its water. And if any of you travel outside of Massachusetts, you know that our water is good. That being said, this is a, ma a multi-year major construction project. The tunnel will be 4.5 miles running from the western town line under the wall dam to the fernal site. The purpose of the tunnel is to provide redundancy for MWRA water lines for Walton and for all of the com communities to the north of Walton. The tunnel is 10 feet in diameter and will be placed approximately 300 feet underground um, and all 4.5 miles of extracted rock will be excavated via the tunnel shaft, the construction shaft located along Waverly Oaks Road. The residents will be impacted by noise, dust, associated heavy construction vehicles, and traffic. MWRA Metropolitan Water Tunnel Director Kathy Murtaugh stated at the City Council meeting on June 21st, um, two years ago, that up to heavy, uh, 100 heavy dump trucks uh, per day would be operating on Waverly Oaks Road um, Monday through Friday for five years. The construction will start in 2026, and the ultimate finish date is 2037. Uh, for comparison, I believe the new high school that was built, that excavation had about 300 dump trucks per day, but for just about one year. So if you add up um, 300 versus um, 500, it's about double uh, the construction activity over time as compared to the high school site, the new high school. Um, if the matter is approved by the city council and the mayor, then MWRA would both get a temporary easement over about three acres 
and then a fee interest for one acre for operation of the site. And if you look at the map here, um, what's outlined in red, this is Waverly Oaks Road here. This is Chapel Street going into the firm. They would get a temporary easement, and then when the um, tunnel was completed, they would get a, a fee interest outlined in blue here. Um, I believe it's my opinion that the matter deserves its own input hearing for the residents of Ward 3, 4, and actually 6, who will be greatly impacted for at least five years, potentially more. Um, the direct neighbors should participate in getting explicit conditions related to the five-year construction project, such as the following. What are the hours of the operation of the excavation? Um, will the dump truck operation conflict with school buses? What are the noise abatements being offered? What are the dust abatements? Will the dump trucks have covers? Will they have wells to clean their tires before they exit the site? Will trucks be allowed to sit idle? Where will the extracted water from the tunnel be deposited knowing that Waverly Oaks Road and Linden Street frequently flood? Um, is there a backup location when Waverly Oaks Road and Linden Street are flooded? And how much water will be extracted each day? Apparently when you dig that deep into bedrock, it's like a rain forest that just constantly rains. So that water has to come up and be placed somewhere. And if it's placed in Florence Meadow, that just vectors off to the intersection of Waverly Oaks Road in Linden Street, which we all know floods very frequently. <laughs> and um, where will the excavated fill be transported to? Not the firm. <laughs> I hope not. Um, and will NWRA contribute to resurfacing the roadways once they've dumped them all up with all these heavy vehicles? Um, the Walton Land Trust asked many good questions to NWRA during its environmental impact report. Um, but the proposed tunnel construction shaft site has changed from, uh, from the northern part of the field station on Beaver Street to now being along Waverly Oaks Road. Um, and I believe that was done, um, yes, I believe that was done because um, they also wanted to put a construction shaft um, west of where the power plant is located. But as you all know, in the last meeting when I described, the city has moved its CPW waste management operations, the yard, uh, to the site west of the power plant. So that meant that MWRA, MWRA had to look at a different site. So now their proposed site is right at the intersection of Waverly Oaks Road and Chapel Lane, the road that takes you right by the power plant. Um, uh, to use this site, MWRA proposes uh, the demolition of three buildings, Cottage 19, Cottage 20, and Garage 57. The cottages are con contributing, um, meaning that they're historically relevant. And I just want to say one other thing. The, um, what's being proposed here are two major projects in one area that's going to negatively affect, obviously, the quality of life for the neighbors in that area for a long time. And um, I, um, I just don't think it's fair to hit these neighbors with two projects at once, one that's going to last until 2037, and then have uh, up to 100 trucks per day. And then the other is already been done, moving the CPW facility to the front site. Um, and I'd like to read you, finally, here. Um, I attended the Ward 5 and Ward 6 Master Plan Committee meeting, um, which was held, I think, at the Government Center roughly two years ago. And three different residents got up and you know basically stated that they were they wanted the city to remove the city yard located on Lexington Street to somewhere else because of the noise and the disruption that it causes. Um, and luckily that was recorded at, on 781 News. I believe that's why I was able to watch that. Um, and I'm going to read you one of the 
excerpts from a resident of Oakley Lane speaking about this. He says, and I quote, we also live directly behind the city yard, so we're interested in a relocation of the yard. I know for CPW, the yard serves a purpose for the city. You know, we need to have one. But it's all day long. It's loud. You can hear it. You know, Sean Dirkby's been there. Trucks backing up all day long, all night long. Dump trucks loading, loading. So you know it's a big, huge, and intense, and a lot of my neighbors can attest to it, end quote. I won't read the, the other two quotes because they're basically the same. So um, this, no one from the master plan committee meetings for Ward 3 or Ward 4 asked to have a CBW relocated to the Fernal site. That was not, that was made directly by the mayor last year. And now they're getting this even bigger, twice as big as the high school site, would be this potential NWRA underground tunnel five, uh, for roughly five miles to the western border. And I don't know if you know how it works, but they dig down um, 300 feet. They drop this vehicle. It's the mining vehicle. It's called the TDM. And that vehicle starts at the furnal at Wavy Lopes and munches the gravel, the rock, the bed, the bedrock, um, and then there's a conveyor belt which extracts that material off the shaft and into the dump trucks within, which then take it to a licensed landfill site. And um, those trucks will be operating because all of the fill under the proposal that I've been reading here, all of the fill for the 4.5 miles will be ex excavated at the Wavy Lopes site. And that's why it's going to be over five years. Um, that's the input. So the council has not yet voted on that. And so I would hope that before any vote of the city council, that they conduct a citizen input meeting for the residents of Wards 4, Wards 3, and also Ward 6 here at Beaver Street, uh, to gain their input and to apprise these people what's coming down the line. Thank you for coming to this afternoon. we were going to be giving you some idea of the sorts of comments and questions that you can make on Wednesday when you come to the city input meeting on Wednesday. There's one right there. I'm going to introduce Diana Young. Diana is a, oh, Diana is a former member of Waltham's Community Preservation Committee. She was the chair of the Community Preservation Committee when Waltham acquired the photo property. So Diana also has intimate knowledge of that process. Uh, she's one of the founding members of the Waltham, the Fertile Working Group, which was uh, incepted, became, they did it in 2003, made up of members of the Land Trust, the League of Women Voters, and Watch. Diana's going to talk today about the City of Waltham issuing, well, the Mayor issuing requests for proposals, RFPs for the six buildings for housing use. And what are the impacts of this, and what should the public know about this? So please join us if you're not giving Diana.
are so quiet. Anyway, the first building is the North Building, which is the one that Brian just described as the one building that he thought was in pretty good shape of these six. It was built in uh, 1897, so very soon after the firm moved to Waltham. And it has 25 rooms currently. That doesn't tell you how a developer might change that. But it will be used for adult daycare. Uh, the next one is the Dolan, uh, which I think we showed uh, its part, its, its uh, twin, um, built in 1906, um, with 50 rooms, but it's just not that big a building, so the, the rooms are presumably small, and it's for veterans housing. Uh, the third uh, in this set is the North Nurses Building. Um, that was built in 1904. It has 43 rooms, where, and it's for disabled individuals uh, aged 22 uh, and, and older. Uh, it's, it's not really relevant to what they're going to do, but the North Building and the North Nurses Building, I'll show you in a map in a minute, um, are on the, the, the part of the property that was acquired with the CPA money for uh, Recreation, open space, and historic preservation. Um, so the outsides of the building will be you have to be maintained. But that's also true of the other buildings that were not um, uh, on the CPA portion of the property because the city has an agreement with the Mass Historical Commission and with uh, DCAM, which I'll explain in a minute. The, uh, Oh, I just screwed up my uh, slide. Yeah, there's time before. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me explain it. The McDougal was built in 1898, again, yeah, an early building with uh, 42 rooms. That's going to be for seniors, um, 62 and older, at 60% of uh, area median income. Area median income is uh, a basis for determining various kinds of affordable housing. 60% uh, of, of area-wide uh, median income for a family of, or for one person, would be about 62,400. And for a couple, would be 71,300. The next one is the sequin, which would be um, built much later in 1934, with 37 rooms currently. For seniors, 60 plus, but only 25% would be affordable. The other 75% would be market rate uh, apartments or uh, rooms. And uh, market, 60% uh, when they say just affordable, that means usually 80% of area median income. So that would be for a, um, for a couple, uh, let's see, that would be about 90, uh, 90 almost 95,000, and for a single person, it would be 80, almost 83,000. So um, at least there, that's, that's the affordable units. Um, so what, getting back to the site visit, what happens whenever you have an RFP? is the city tells the people who might be interested, come take a site, visit, come look at it. And um, you know, you can see the buildings, uh, look at them, whatever. And the, uh, the uh, purchasing department will tell them something about the buildings, and then we'll accept questions in writing. So if you do go, you're not going to get any answers beyond what the city tells you at that time but it's, you still may find it interesting. The first three um, buildings will uh, have their uh, site visit on uh, April 10th at 10 o'clock in the morning. Coming in to the, uh, uh, the back entrance, so Waverly Oaks Road, um, so that'll be on the 10th for the first three, and on the 17th for the next three. See if the map shows up okay. This is the map, and I'm not sure how well it would be room is if the light is not as good as I would like. But the three buildings. Right up here, so they're quite distant uh, from each other. And then the 
second day, on April 17th, will be these three buildings, uh, Tarville, uh, Sequin, and McDougall. Um, and there seems to be some dispute based on all the papers I found as to whether or not McDougall is with, is MC or MAC, but I don't think that affects what we're going to be doing with it. <laughs> um, let me tell you what's in the, uh, the, the proposal. This is where the city basically lays out what the lease will look like if somebody places a bid that the city accepts. And it is under no obligation to accept any bids. Um, so the lease term currently is listed in the RFP as being 10 to 30 years. But the, uh, it says that they'll consider longer, but it will take an action of the legislature to go longer than 30 years. The important thing is, uh, in talking to some people who develop affordable housing, and I'm, I'm a tax lawyer by trade, although this is not my area, um, you generally need a 99-year lease, which is basically treated as being the same as owning the building, to be able to get some of the financing that you're going to need to do a major project like this, like looking at the pictures Ryan right showed, where they're they need to be gutted. Um, and there are credits available for doing work uh, on historic uh, buildings and also on buildings with affordable housing, both federal and state. They're very complicated formulas, but the federal one is 20% uh, for federal, 30% uh, some number for uh, housing. It's not an insignificant number. And so uh, anybody who's doing this is in the business of doing affordable housing is going to want this longer lease. So hopefully the city will, they will uh, consider doing it. The rent in the RFP says it will be nominal, doesn't say how much, but that the buildings go to the party who wins the bid as is. So with uh, all the destruction that's taken place, there's fairly substantial uh, insurance requirements from day one even before people have moved in. And what's more, the, the person who takes the lease has to rehab the building, install the utilities, um, bring the building up to code, within all that within 24 months, and all changes require approval of the building department, which would be normal, the city council and the mayor. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is the, uh, the heating systems for most of the buildings that we're talking about all came under two pipes from the power plant at the back of the Colonel Warp towards Waverly Oak Road. So they'll have to put in complete new systems. And uh, it's their responsibility to do that. Um, and it says that the, the, the exterior uh, must be uh, rehabilitated to basically bring it back to work. So it's a fair amount uh, to, to bear. Um, and I'm going to explain in a minute why I think the rent is normal, I mean, a nominal. The city, when it bought the firm, it signed an agreement. The agreement, there were several agreements. One was a land disposition agreement. And that agreement was with the uh, Department of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance, of, of, often called DCAM, because who can say all that? Um, so, as part of the deal, is if Wal if Waltham were to sell or lease any part of the Furlan property as base, half the profit, uh, or the net proceeds, excuse me, net proceeds goes to DCAM. Um, if, though, they wanted to encourage certain behaviors, if it was for affordable housing, DCAM uh, share drops by 10%, so they would only get 40% of the net proceeds. Um, and then there was another one. There was actually a whole bunch of ways you could reduce the amount of DCAM share, but of the ones that were applicable, if there were a master plan, uh, if Waltham completes a citywide master plan that includes firm, DCAM share drops down by another two and a half. Of course, as you may know, we don't have a master plan. There's still, we had all those meetings, but they never finished it. So, um, 
I think that's the reason for the nominal rent, because that's going to be the net proceeds. The city's not going to take anything much from the lessee. It's, the lessee's going to bear all the costs, but the city's going to get a little bit of money, so it's going to share that little bit of money if you can. Um, by the way, I think this also could have an impact on the MWRA lease. Uh, there's a, a, I don't know what you can't, I mean, uh, the MWRA proposed to pay, but he can presumably get a share of that money. There was nothing that said if the city leases to the state to, to get out of doing it. So we'll have to wait and see when we finally get more details. I don't want to spend a minute. So anyway, um, just let me reiterate. Jeopardy 
for part of the recreation area, uh, including a well over 100 year tulip tree, which is a very rare tree, which is slated for, um, for taking down. Um, so we want to really bear that in mind when we speak on Wednesday. Also to evaluate the financial and other aspects of the federal project. Accountability to ask questions of city government, to keep them accountable and to ensure transparency throughout this project. I'm just thinking about how much transparency there's been up somewhere. <laughs> to empower us to give the public an opportunity to speak directly to the City Council and others, to influence them to make sure that the fertile property ultimately provides an area that is useful to us and respectful to the previous residents and staff that were part of this historic uh, site. So, with that, I'm just going to do one more thing, which is, and then we're going to do questions and answers. I'm going to invite Jonathan up. So, if you want to start thinking about maybe some questions that you have, we'll bring the panel back up and, and if you can ask questions of all the folks that have spoken. Uh, but just also, we were very, um, we, we did, three or four of us did go to, did go follow on Zoom, the Conservation Commission Concom uh, meeting on Thursday night, where we learned about the wetlands issue. There are, these meetings are regular meetings, and they will be held on the following Thursdays at 7 p.m. April 4th, May 2nd, and May 16th. So if you have a mind to jump on the Zoom, uh, it is published, the Zoom is published. Um, we also have put an email address on our handout today. If you want to reach out to us via that email address to ask for a Zoom link, or any other information about these meetings, please feel free to do so. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jonathan. I'm going to invite, uh, I'm going to invite Oliver, I'm going to invite Brian back up, I'm going to invite George and Diana back up to come to the podium. This is going to be our runner with the, um, the other microphone. So if you have a question, now's your opportunity to ask it. Thank you everybody for your time and attention today. Hi everyone, uh, can you please raise your hand if you plan on making it Wednesday? Love to see that. Uh, and keep your hand raised if you know three people in Waltham. <laughs> yeah, we all do. Okay, so we're going to bring those people with us on Wednesday. Uh, let's make sure to be visible, loud, and clear. Uh, but thank you so much again. My name is Jonathan Buss. We had amazing presentations here. We talked a little bit about the past. Uh, about imagining, reimagining what was possible, what really happened. You've already heard directly from um, Mr. Fernald's very family here. Um, and uh, we, we, saw, we saw some pictures, there's a new website up, and then you heard a little bit about the MWRA project and housing and housing proposals. So do you folks have any questions? All right, I'll start here because I saw you first. I'm gonna... Okay, I just wanna... What's going on right now? I just drove by. What's going on right now? because I just drove by on my way to the meeting and I was horrified. Yeah, there's been a ton of work. Yeah, there's only yeah, it's, it's, it's it's more. Got the I mean, there was a lot of rain last night, obviously. It, why is this happening so fast? So uh, I can tell you what happened. That is the first recreational project that was approved by the city council at the end of last year. And that's the nine point five million dollar universal playground. Yeah, Alameda Park, the railroad, the um, Dixon Park, and then the memorial, and then there's three different fields. Um, there were three no votes for that on the city council of the three of us that are here. But that moved forward. It's moving forward very quickly, and that's the area that has the weapon issue that we that I described earlier. It's obvious right now. I mean. Yeah. Uh, we can see Gary over there. Can you get your hand raised also? Can you raise your hand? Who else had a question? All right, we're going to go in the back and then there. So. Can I ask two questions? Let's try to agree. Yes. First one is last meeting, we talked about the lack of proper infrastructure within that site for housing, electricity, 
sewer, water, all has to be replaced. Does the city plan on replacing that infrastructure prior to the lease or is the lease lessee responsible for that infrastructure improvement? I think Dan is going to take this one. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I don't think we know completely. Uh, we know that they talk about them uh, providing utilities, but it doesn't get much of an explanation. That's where uh, I would assume that the site visit might give some of that information. Uh, but I suspect the city has no intentions of doing very much there. Um, so I'll have to wait and see. One more question. Thank you. The second question is regarding the city council and the obvious problems of tax revenue. Um, I'm sort of starting to see commercial sites being unoccupied. Um, the city plan has a certain amount of revenue in it. Um, do we have the $9.5 million to develop on the site? Or can we ask the city council Wednesday night, possibly to scale back, not put key railroad in, maybe on a vision but certainly a memorial park. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, uh, to be quick, I think uh, we, we did sign on to a loan authorization, which is in full effect. You know, we're seeing work out there, it's, it's happening. Uh, I mean, under different kind of leadership, under real serious pressure from the council, maybe there can be a way for further spending. Uh, but once the order's out, once the money's taken, it's, it's moving. So, yeah, I mean, that's a political question, right? Uh, the same way it's a political question why there were certain councillors who voted against having a citizen input hearing. Uh, I think two or three councillors voted against us having Wednesday happen, but if it wasn't for you guys sending out over 900 letters, um, they finally came around to saying, hey, let's hear from the people, right? So these are political questions. Um, in the back, what's your, what's your name? Oh, yeah. All right,
a couple of small holes in the roof have just grown wider and wider, so a lot of water is getting into the wiper right now. It's, it's saveable, but not mothballable. Is that even a word, mothballable? But to George's point, I think North Hall is, is in pretty good shape. The superintendent's uh, cottage, or mansion, whatever you want to call it, is in pretty good shape. Uh, they should mop all those buildings, absolutely. And, oh, I wanted to mention one thing too, Diana. Um, chart, the, the numbers of those rooms were off. I, I don't know where those numbers came from. They came from the RFP. Oh, interesting. Well, they're, they're all off. Oh, okay. They're all incorrect. I think we have one more question. We're going to this going here, here and then we'll jump there. Hi, um, I'm just joining this, uh, so I don't know anything. I'm learning an awful lot tonight. But um, I live in Wood 3, right off the Marble Road. So this week, coming on to Marble Road to get on to Travel Road to see all that they dug up on that beautiful hill, which was the only place that kids could sled. It would be, you know, on a snowy day. So that's all dug up, and they are going to put a railroad in for kids? The shark center? Yeah. So, yeah, so you want to know what's going on on Trent Road in the impact of cost in the past two weeks. Yeah. That's the beginning and start of the $9.5 million recreation project, which has a universal playground, a kitchen pot, a railroad, a, um, uni um, a three fields with weight stations. Now, mind you, um, the city council had passed two resolutions that I authored. One was to preserve Owl Hill as a sledding hill, and the other was to preserve Donald Field, which is the field on the right-hand side, because that area of North Waltham doesn't have recreational, general recreational fields. That was approved in the city council by an order, and, and I have that in my files. Um, what, this, what the mayor did is that the land got transferred to, under the council vote, got transferred to the recreation department. And they came up with this proposal uh, for this recreation area. Um, again, there were three no votes, because this vote just happened in dis December. And I even wanted to go up and explain, give a PowerPoint presentation to my peers in the council. I asked for permission to go to the, what's the now? The, the um, not the pulpit, the podium. The podium, to approach the podium with my laptop to give the PowerPoint. And I was denied that by the president of the city council because they didn't want me, they didn't want anyone watching at home to hear what I was going to say. I, I still, stated, but I had no PowerPoint presentation. So, mind you, the neighbors in Ward 3 and Ward 4 wanted to preserve the green fields in the front of Fernald. With 196 acres, there's more than enough land to put any type of playground, any type of pitch and putt. They didn't have to do that, but they went ahead anyway against the wishes of the neighbors. And, and that's really it in a nutshell. And it, it's just very sad. It's very sad. and. Um, I don't know what to say. We got yeah, more if the council people lived in that neighborhood, it, it would have gotten another no. But that's what really bothers me about the city council. They're very quick to not agree with the neighbors that they don't live in. Thank you for sharing. I think we got two more questions here. Um, these two folks, and then we'll jump here, and then we'll get to this. So given where things stand now and what is underway, what is the most effective message that can be delivered to council on Wednesday? Come on Wednesday evening and speak. If you can't come, you can send something in writing to the city clerk and have it officially read into the record. That's that's the first step. Um, second step will be to follow these meetings that we're holding. Um, we'll be having more of them and we'll provide more information on where we can leverage individual counselors, the mayor, and et cetera, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I think of one, two, three is number one, the reverse course in the amusement park, which is tearing up the neighborhood. Number two is asking for a master plan 
um, which it's a comprehensive view, and number three is actually having a community input process, uh, which is not what's happening. Uh, one public hearing is not going to solve it all. So those are my top three. There may be people who want to talk about the history, the preservation, housing. There will be a lot of things to discuss, but we're really focused on those three things. Uh, that helps your presentation. Yeah, of course, I just wanted to say thank you to you all. I'm a member of the neighborhood and have not known what's going on, and so I appreciate the opportunity to learn about it. Um, it was illuminating at that city council meeting to hear that uh, some members of the city council only expect to hear from the public during election season and otherwise aren't really interested. Um, so I appreciate this opportunity to have uh, the, the public forum. I'm just curious to hear why um, has there been any explanation of why they've allowed these buildings to languish into abandonment and neglect for 10 years? I mean, not, not that that might help, but just curious. <laughs> Before we jump into the others, uh, your historical perspective, the questions are I mean, it's a great question. I think it gets to the heart of the matter. I think, I think the reasons behind it is Waltham bought an incredibly complicated property, 196 acres with all of these buildings in various levels of repair. It would have taken somebody, a leadership with a real vision and a real, real strength to, to keep it all together. I think it just became easier to decide, well, these buildings are really complicated, let's just keep thinking about it or let's keep debating it. And I think it just essentially led to this slow destruction. I also think there's also, in a sense, a way that though they're historically protected, they're historically protected buildings of disability history. So these are not maybe necessarily people who can advocate for themselves or who we view as necessarily a part of our history. It's kind of like, that's history, kind of, you know. But these are historically preserved buildings just like any other buildings. But I think there wasn't as much, there were, you know, if a hospital, if a cancer hospital left patient records on the ground, you'd probably hear from the patients being like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you can't do that. But, you know, you had uh, a lot of people who were at the Pearl Alert alone were alive. And um, not a lot of people, you know, have strong advocacy networks for it. So I think those are the reasons. But it's also, I don't think there's any really good reason. Who was there before? That's what I'm Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's right. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I think there, there maybe is one thing that um, what we said. One of the things that we, I think, have talked about doing, if we can get them to come, is um, at the same time that Walt then bought the pearl, uh, the, the town of Medfield bought uh, its state hospital. Uh, a little bit smaller uh, property, but um, they're also a much smaller town. And they went through a process of uh, a real inter interactive community planning process um, where they gathered uh, information. A lot of the citizens were very actively involved, apparently. They hired a consultant to help lead that whole process of getting the community's um, views. I, I don't know if any of you were around when we, uh, when we did the planning for the rail trail, where they had the consultants, they came in, they gave some ideas, they asked for citizen input. After they heard it, there were some things that they learned that they didn't know before, they made changes, they brought it back a couple of times. That's the kind of process that should have been used. And in fact, we actually proposed, and the council voted for it, um, for an hour we uh, posed, uh, this was uh, a couple of uh, citizens uh, uh, took the uh, RFP that Medfield used to hire the consultant, and we walthamized it, and we submitted it, and the council voted yes, but not by a very high number, but at the same time there was a proposal for what's called an RFI, request for information that was put up by the mayor. Um, where you get people to give you information for free, but you, you tell them we don't have to use any of it, and they didn't. Um, and so the problem 
is the council doesn't have the authority to issue an RFP. It's the administration of the mayor and the uh, emergency department. So our proposal went in one place. <laughs> We're just going to try to go for a few guys because we have a few more minutes left and we want to be respectful of people's time. Go for it. No. So this question is for George. If I remember correctly, uh, and, and correct any of my misremembering or misunderstanding, but the last meeting, did you say that the uh, MWRA plan uh, doesn't even have any benefit to the city of Waltham, and you all also mentioned, or you just wondered why the, the um, project wasn't run through this, the towns or whatever that was going to directly affect. Do I remember that correctly? Yeah, you know what? It does benefit the wall thing because it provides redundancy for, I think, that half of the wall is supplied. Um, but it also benefits all of the cities to the north. Um, and um, yeah. it's needed. We don't have a redundant system. It is needed in the state. You all remember, I think it was 2005 when we, when the um, western pipes broke and yeah. you know, we were without water for several days. So it is needed. But um, there should be more transparency, especially with the neighbors that are going to be heavily impacted. And then couple that with the mayor's decision to place CPW right next to it. Um, so they're getting the double when the residents of Ward 4 and Ward 3 are getting the double whammy that they never had before. So. And, and since it's an MWRA project, do the citizens of Walking have any Say, I mean, or is the it city, just the city of Waltham, um, the city council, and the mayor both have to approve and sign uh, both the, the the temporary lease and the fee interest that they want for the small section. So yes, the city council and the mayor have to approve that. Um, but you know, there needs to be, meetings, in my opinion, there needs to be meetings with the neighbors to apprise them of what's going on, what's being discussed, and that hasn't happened. We have one more question here. Yep. Thanks a lot. George, uh, do you know if the um, all the commercial enterprises, mainly the office buildings and the gas station that are you know right across the street from where this proposal is going, are they aware of this happening? I don't know. I mean that's one of the largest landowners, it's wealthiest families in all of You know, the built the Duffy buildings. Duffy buildings, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's any Duffy buildings. We've got room, but, more questions. You know, I was just wondering, you don't know if they've had any input on this. I don't know. Uh, Professor Green, in the back. And then we have one last one. Okay, thanks. Thanks for noticing me. Yep, we did. Sorry. Thanks so much for the brief. Um, two points of that and then a question. Um, the city council turned down a um, request from Council President Carter to look for unmarked graves on the property, um, which is a serious concern that former residents have raised. Um, as I understand it, the people tasked with designing the memorial are a small group of people around the mayor who, like the mayor, believe that the front of was a wonderful place and that its history should be celebrated um, and that uh, everything that happened there was a great story. Um, what can people ask on Wednesday as part of this hearing about that specifically? Because I, uh, there's a lot of this that obviously um, is chilling to me, but that that aspect um, somehow leads up to me as, as the place where this becomes something really revolting. So um, the late Georgie Halleck, um, had a discussion and she suggested that the city do ground penetrating radar on the entire site to determine such matters and that hasn't been done and that hasn't been done even on this first section as they've done about over the past two weeks. So you, you raise a great point and I think you know more about this than many of us right, due to the interviews that you've had with the former residents. What would make what would be the best thing to say on Wednesday night? That's um, what people here are asking. What do you want us all to say on Wednesday night? That this has been um, in, in a total um, 
Can you get OSHA or the Army Corps of Engineers to join your fight? And are you part of the historical society? Are you registered, the firm? Is it registered? Maybe you should get registered for more protection. And then if you have to bring in state or federal, bring in state and federal. Yeah, I mean, that um, point is valid. The Mass Historic Commission um, has, has control over the entire site as does the local, uh, the local historical commission. So I would hope that any activity would have to get their approval on, on the site. Uh, but to that point, I mean, what we could ask is um, has been reports of uh, graves at the site. And um, has the city conducted radar of the site to um, see if these stories are true? Um, does anyone have any last questions? All right, well, in the spirit of time, um, we just want to thank you all for making it. Thank you again for expressing your voice. Um, and let's make sure to make our voices heard this Wednesday. Uh, please be in touch. We have folks here who are staying around to talk, ask, ask, answer questions. But please make sure people know about Wednesday. Thank you so much. Have a great day.